a mother of three in Texas goes missing. To get through it, I have to put myself in the frame of mind. She's not my sister. Like, it's a TV show that I'm watching. It's somebody else. Clues lead to suspects and more frustration. We couldn't catch him in any tangible lies or untruths. But the family will stop at nothing to uncover the truth. I was not going to live the way I'd been living. I had to have that justice. I looked him in the face and I told him, I know you did something to my sister, and I will find out, and I will make you pay. On an unusually mild December day in Amarillo, Texas, Jackie Bolden is planning her large family's annual holiday celebration when she receives some troubling news. Barrick, my son-in-law, called me on December 8th. Barrick, what's going on? He wanted to know where Kathy was. Of course, I didn't know where she was. I had no idea where she was. What do you mean she hasn't been home all night? That's when I began to get alarmed. I was very alarmed. Have you called her friends? <sighs> Barrick tells Jackie Kathy left for work the previous morning, December 7th, and never returned. Can you call the police? Of course, I'll do it right now. OK, just please let me know. I will. All right, goodbye. The report that came in was for a missing person. You get a lot of those. People leave on their own free will. Hopefully, that's the kind of case you get. This one was Kathy Barnum was missing. Right away, you want to find Kathy. You know she's out there. The question is, where? Kathy Barnum was our firstborn daughter. She seemed to meet people very easily and not have any difficulty in making friends. Then after her, I had Brenda, and then we had Charlene, my baby girl. Kathy was a very beautiful type of person. She was my role model. I always tried to be like her because she was a champ. When Kathy went out with some friends one night, she first met Barrick. A manager at a local restaurant, Barrick is full of charm. He was from the Panhandle, from a small town. Of course, my impression after having lived in Panhandle, Texas, I knew how warm and friendly and personable that the small town life was. You new in town? I don't think I've seen you around here before. Uh, no, no, I, I grew up here, I just... Oh, really? Yeah. We haven't come to this bar before, so... Oh, I'm really glad you did. They met Labor Day, and they married in January. It was a whirlwind. Now, Kathy and Barrick have three young boys of their own. 11-year-old Jared, 8-year-old Ryan, and Bradley, who is seven when she was growing up. She never mentioned kids or anything. And all of a sudden, when she's a mother, there is nothing greater. Her kids were her life. She was absolutely awestruck, and she felt like this was a miracle that had happened in her life, and so she was just overjoyed. Kathy isn't the type of mother to leave her family under any circumstances. So her mother, father, and sisters refuse to sit back and leave things to the authorities. Her sister Charlene rushes over to Kathy's house to see her anxious brother-in-law. Me and him went in the kitchen, and I just started asking him questions from the beginning. When's the last time you saw her? I heard Tuesday she came home. 
He said Tuesday she came home from bringing the kids home from school. She came into the house. She was tired and wanted to sleep. So he took it upon himself to take the kids out to eat, bring them home, clean up a little bit around the house, and they all went to bed. Right, we came back, went to sleep, everything was normal. Then... When he woke up the next morning, she was gone. Her car was gone, and she was gone. He just figured she had gone to work, and he didn't know what happened. I would do anything to bring her back. We miss her. Later in the day, Barrick gives the same statement to the police down at the station. Investigators also question Kathy's oldest son, Jared. Thanks for coming in to talk with us. You're welcome. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? What did they see? When, when did their mother leave? The kids told me that they saw Kathy lying on the bed with the sheets pulled up to her chin the night before. She was sleeping. When was the last time you saw your mom? The morning. The oldest child, Jared, told me that the three kids were sleeping. And early in the morning, he remembers Kathy walking through that living room area towards the front door. Do you have a chance to talk with your mom at all? Where she stops, says something to him about loving him, and then gives him a kiss and leaves. I thought she was going to work. Yeah. Kathy's husband, Barrick, welcomes officers in to search their home, hoping to find some clue of where Kathy may be. Barrick showed us around, explained the house set up. That's how we got started. He was not worried about taking us anywhere in that house that we wanted us to go. You want to look through the drawers? Look through the drawers. You want to look under the bed? Yeah, feel free to do that. Look anywhere you want, no problem. And we did. We see a house that's lived in. Kids live there. Parents live there. A mother who probably doesn't have a lot of time to care for the house. So you, you can see a little bit of disarray, but no blood, no furniture overturned, no broken mirrors, no other sign that, that there's been any family violence there. Reassured that things within Kathy's home seem normal, detectives begin to question the neighbors. Part of a good neighborhood canvas is you start at one end of the block down here, you go as far as you think anybody could have seen anything. One of our witnesses over here across the street who, who knew Kathy and Barrick, knew who they were, said that she saw Kathy leave and get in the car and uh, drive away. The neighbor's sighting of Kathy leaving on her own early the morning she went missing confirms everything Barrick and the children have told detectives about the last time they saw her. So we're working under the consideration that Kathy doesn't want to be found. One of the things we did to try to see if Kathy had left the country was contact the federal system that collects intelligence uh, data for border crossings. We had them run the license plate of Kathy's car to see if it had crossed into Mexico anywhere. Uh, they didn't have a record of that. Kathy's mother, Jackie, joined by Kathy's father and sisters, take up their own hunt for the missing mother. We were driving up and down the streets. We only have one airport here in Amarillo. So we were looking at the airport to see if her car might have been at the airport. We drove on all of the highways that are entering and exiting Amarillo so that if her car was parked or abandoned somewhere out there, we might be able to find it. I mean, whatever we could think of. I was a maniac. I was searching for Kathy. I was determined I was going to find her one way or another. Several days after police searched Kathy's residence, her sister Charlene shows up at the house. With the boys at school and Barrick nowhere in sight, she decides to take a look around. I want to go look through the house. I knew the police had already walked through the house, but I wanted to do it myself. So I just started searching and trying to find anything. I mean, I didn't even know what I was looking for. 
a blood stain, a letter, paper, anything that might be helpful in finding out what happened. And then I found a knife from their kitchen with blood on it and the tip of the blade broke off. I'm thinking, what is this? What happened with this? I don't know what this was used for or done with it, but obviously it was good. a week after mother of three, Kathy Barnum, went missing. A bloody knife found in the house ignites new fears of violence. Until police get a call from the local hospital. It turns out Kathy's husband, Barrick, after dropping his children off at school, came home and stabbed himself. He was so overwrought by Kathy being missing and everything the way he saw life that he just decided to end it all. I, I know it seems overwhelming, but we need you in one piece, okay? It was a kind of a pathetic kitchen knife and stabbed himself in the chest with it. It broke and the end went sailing off. You gotta take care of yourself, Barrick. I just couldn't do it anymore, Detective. Do it for Kathy. But behind his friendly concern, Detective Tenbring can't help wondering if Barrick may have hurt himself out of guilt for hurting Kathy. They ask him to take a polygraph test. Is your name Barrick Barnum? Yes. Is Kathy Barnum your wife? Yes. Do you know where Kathy Barnum is? No, I do not. You look for verbal clues that tell you that this person is uh, not telling the truth. He didn't exhibit any of those. He always talked about Kathy in the present tense. He never alluded to the fact that he thought she was dead. Barrick came across very much that he, he missed Kathy. The lie detector test takes Barrick off the suspect list. Hoping to drum up new leads, investigators dig into other aspects of Kathy's life, including the company she started. Hi, I just have a couple of questions about Kathy. Sure. Um, I was able to talk to an employee of the medical credentialing business owned by uh, uh, Kathy. Tell me a little bit about the company. Um, well, it's a, it's a growing company and it, it's got its struggles. It's a little touch and go, but I mean, we've all been pitching. One of the things that I was told early on by Jackie was that this was a very successful business. There's money in this business. We want to know where it is. But when I talked to a few of those investors, they were all out money and didn't see any result in their investment. And they're very unhappy about it. Randy looked at Kathy's uh, bank statements. I think they were overdrawn as well, so they really didn't have any cash assets at all. Jackie was sure beyond a reasonable doubt that there would be a lot of money, and, and hoping there was because there's still boys to take care of. So I, I understand that, but there was no money. It made me think that well, maybe she wants to leave because the business is going to fold and perhaps she's mismanaged the money or worse, and that's her motivation to leave. Investigators conduct an exhaustive search of her business records, but despite being cash-strapped, detectives find no trace of suspicious deposits or withdrawals from the business. Kathy's mother, Jackie, isn't so sure they've dug deep enough. I began to call friends whose numbers that I had and knew of and asked them if they knew or had heard from Kathy or had seen her or knew where she was. Hello? Hi, Jackie. And I spoke to Mary Moses because she worked in the office with Kathy. Kathy's co-worker can't offer any deeper insight about the business situation. 
You might want to check with Brian. But she does mention that Kathy left the office for an extended period the day before she went missing with a man named Brian. When Jackie goes to speak with him, Brian admits he saw Kathy that afternoon. Yeah, I, I was with her, actually, the afternoon before she went missing. But it's what he shares next that stuns Jackie. He goes on to say that he and Kathy had been romantically involved for several months. Brian had just recently joined the church. And so he and Kathy ended up meeting through those meetings at the church. And then they started seeing one another outside of the church. Jackie had known that Kathy and Barrick had been having some marital problems over the last year, and that Kathy had been going to church more often. But she had no idea her new friend from church had become her lover. Despite her surprise at learning her daughter's secret, Jackie stays focused on finding out what Brian knows about the day she disappeared. As soon as he got off of work, he went over to Kathy's office, and he says, Barrett called her and asked her to pick the boys up. And so she asked Brian to ride with her. And between the office and Kathy's house, he said, you know, Kathy, I'm not feeling comfortable about this. I don't want to do this. You know, with the kids and Barrick, okay, it well, doesn't feel right. Of course, I totally understand that. He told her, just drop me off at my house. And after you pick Jared up and drop him off, then come back and pick me up. That was it. She didn't go pick him up. She didn't go back to work. She didn't call. Nothing. Brian tried to call Kathy and got no response. He figured she couldn't leave her kids that night, so he gave up trying to reach her. After Jackie fills detectives in, they pay Brian a visit. Hi there. Hi, Detective Tenbrink. Detective Gilmore. Gentlemen. Hi, could we ask you a few questions about Kathy? Kathy Barnum? Do you mind if we come in? Um, is that really necessary? Not necessary. But it would be very helpful to us. Sure, yeah, come in. Immediately upon walking in the house, it became apparent pretty quickly that, that there was more to that friendship than just a platonic friendship. You walk in, here's a low table, there are lit candles and a picture of Kathy in the middle of this table facing the door as you walk in. That's not normal behavior. Where were you the night that she disappeared? Brian gives them the same story he gave to Jackie. I mean, I cared for Kathy. Brian is so desperate to show that he loved Kathy and he misses her so much that he's made a memorial to her. Brian came across as trying to be very concerned about Kathy when it was pretty obvious, at least I thought, that he was pretty concerned about us thinking that maybe he was involved in this in some way. Brian immediately becomes a person of interest. First, he doesn't have a real good alibi for the time frame in which Kathy uh, disappears. Kathy could have told him that she was going to break up with him, and that made him mad. She uh, could have asked him for uh, money, and that made him mad. If Brian is high on detective's radar, Kathy's husband, Barrick, is the prime suspect in the eyes of Kathy's mother and sisters. With Kathy's marriage on the rocks, having a new man could have sent Barrick over the edge. So Jackie sets up a lunch date to test her son-in-law. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Nice to have everyone here. You know what? I'll, what? I'll grab it. I'll get it. No, no, no I, I got it. I got it. I had just sat down at the table, and the phone rang. He reached over and grabbed the phone and answered it. Hello? And he was pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh, yeah. 
Uh-huh. Click. Walk out the front door. Barrett? Jackie what? will soon learn that the strange call holds the first real lead to finding her daughter. In Amarillo, Texas, Barrick Barnum, whose wife Kathy has been missing for a month, has just made an unexplained exit from his mother-in-law, Jackie's house. Barrick? What was that Are you about? kidding me? Now, just an hour later... You guys! He rushes back in the house with a friend who has incredible news. Then they come back to my house, they bust in the front door, they're screaming and they're yelling. We just found Kathy's car. What? Yeah, he found it. Cecil called me and told me he found it. Yeah, Where? I found it at the park. And my hopes were always, if I if we find the car, then we'll find out what happened to Kathy. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Jackie and her daughters alert the police who meet them at the scene. It was just happenstance that a friend of Barrick's had been driving by this condominium complex and thought he saw Kathy's car there. Before I even pulled into the parking lot, I knew that was her car. The doors to the vehicle are open, but the trunk is locked and the keys are nowhere in sight. No blood is visible, but Kathy's purse and a small travel bag are found. And I got a call from my friend Cecil. He was driving around and I guess recognized him. Cecil he... found the car. Yeah. yeah. Police want to better understand the relationship between the two men. So you're friends with Barrick? Yep. Close friends? Yeah, we're good friends. OK. So you said, hey, it's Kathy's car. I got to call my friend Barrick, right? That's right. Just driving on by? Yep. I don't believe this story. This is too happenstance. Jackie and her daughters had never seen the car there on their many trips around the city looking for Kathy. Police are finding Cecil's story increasingly hard to believe. They were able to get Cecil's consent to search his truck, and they found the keys to Kathy's car. And it was tucked up underneath the car seat right next to the console. Detectives now think Cecil could be involved in Kathy's disappearance. All of a sudden, they said he has the keys. So they open the trunk. I was thinking, oh God, please don't let her be in here. And she wasn't. The tension is too much for Cecil, and he points the finger back at his friend, Barrick, saying it was Barrick who put the keys in his truck. Barrick, without missing a beat upon being interrogated about that, oh, well, the keys were in it, and I just grabbed them and uh, went back and, and talked to this friend of mine and laid him on the seat. Well, I found it exactly the way it is right now. The way it is right now, the door was open. You found it with the door open? I mean, it, it was just ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Finally, Barrick admits he went through the car after he and Cecil arrived and thought it was more important to tell the family about the car before calling police. So for me, I, I, I guess I was just looking for any sign of, of where she might be. Yeah? Yeah. The door was unlocked, and he got in and went through her purse. Barrick's highly questionable story and behavior are throwing up red flags, but they stop short of being proof of his guilt. You can follow these clues all you want and you can not believe them, but if you can't tie it into something physical, you're, you're left with not very much. Police impound the car for further testing while Barrick is allowed to leave. But Kathy's family doesn't need more proof to be convinced Kathy's husband was involved in her disappearance. They use the ride home to conduct their own interrogation. All the way back home, I just kept grilling him and asking him about finding the car. He was like, 
I can't help it if my friend saw the car and then called me and I came back to make sure it was hers. We just found it. Aren't you glad we found it? I didn't want to turn and look at him. So I looked in the mirror at him in the reflection. And when I looked up and saw him, he had the most evil look in his eyes that I've ever seen. In Amarillo, Texas, the car belonging to missing mother Kathy Barnum has been found after a month. When Kathy's car arrives at the police lot, several things stand out as possible clues. The windshield wipers were in the on position. So if you take the key and turn the ignition on, the wipers would automatically start moving because the switch was on. And so that caused Randy to look at weather reports around the night that she was last seen and reported missing. My husband was outside hanging Christmas lights that night, and it was not raining and it did not mist. There was a bag of clothing in that car. Well, the clothes in that bag were not consistent with a woman like Kathy. The clothes that were in that bag, there's nothing anybody that I know would wear, especially in January. But the biggest discovery of all is found in the glove compartment. Drafts of recently completed divorce documents. There was a visit to an attorney and papers. It never went any further than getting the papers and starting to fill them out. The existence of the divorce and the divorce papers would certainly be considered motive to commit the homicide. There's a lot of smoke around Kathy's husband, Barrick, but still no fire. There was nothing in the car found that could give you a reason to go get a warrant for Barrick or Brian or anyone else for that matter. It's just another in the mounting sheet of uh-ohs, uh-ohs. Well, this doesn't look right, this doesn't look right. Well, you don't put people in prison for things that don't look right. With no definitive evidence in the official investigation, two more agonizing months tick by. February and March, it was on my mind every day, every minute of every day, but I didn't know what to do. So now it was just like, I'm just in limbo now waiting. Hi, I'm looking for Detective Timber. Is there any new update on my daughter? I was busy all the time, talking to friends of Kathy's, talking to friends of mine, talking to the police department, talking to Barrick. I have a missing daughter. She's been missing for three months. I went to the FBI. I went to the Texas Rangers, just trying to get any information that I could get. All right. But Jackie is met with dead ends at every turn. Then, more than three months after Kathy's disappearance, the police receive a disturbing call from a local farmer. You can see some cattle out there in the distance, but at the time, there was a, a man out here on a tractor shredding weeds with a big mower. And as he was shredding the weeds, he looked over at the next part he was going to work on. He walked close enough to realize, yes, it was a body. Detectives are called in to investigate the gruesome scene. Their initial survey of the body, the height, hair color, things like that, they immediately suspect it might be Kathy. That she had uh, jewelry present, so that would kind of eliminate robbery as a possible motive. So why has no one found her? With all the open expanse that we have in the Texas Panhandle, her body was fairly close to our airport. So there's traffic out there. So that seemed to me to be an unusual place to leave a body. 50, 60 yards from the road. It's got to be at least that. It gives you some idea of the offender's ability to carry the body that far. It wasn't buried, so it indicates some kind of haste in placing the body there.
Investigators reach out to Jackie and her family with the troubling news. There had been a body found out near the airport. They did not know who it was, but they wanted to make sure that I knew about that before I got home and started watching the news. I, of course, wanted to go out there, but I didn't. This first picture here is the field where Kathy's body was found. The airport is in the background. That's the buildings that you can barely see that's in the background. This picture is a picture of Kathy's jewelry that was found on her body that day. They had us all meet at my mom's house. I believe it was the next day because they had flown the body to Lubbock for an autopsy and took the jewelry, cleaned it up, and then brought it to us the next day so that we could all be there to identify the jewelry that was on the body. We're all sitting around the kitchen table and then he started opening up this envelope and everything was in baggies and they just took out one piece at a time and let us all pass it around. The bracelet, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was hers and I just broke down. The bracelet that dad got him, that dad gave to us. We knew it was Kathy and we couldn't deny it anymore. You can't block it out anymore. It's the awful truth the family has dreaded for months. But their grief will shift into resolve by what the coroner's report reveals. Autopsy said the cause of death was strangulation. That also allows us to better interrogate a suspect because we know how she was murdered. And so that gives us some insight to was there a big fight or was a gun used, a knife used, you know, those types of things. The body is too decomposed to identify any signs of sexual assault. But to investigators, strangulation speaks to an intimate murder which could lead back to the new man in Kathy's life, her boyfriend, Brian. It's a scenario that Jackie's son-in-law, Barrick, won't let go of. He showed up at his house, just out of the clear blue. Brian didn't even know who he was. And he said, oh, you're Brian. Well, I'm Barrick. I'm Kathy's husband. What are you doing here, man? Just want to let you know I know where you live. Get off my property. He literally stalked him. Psycho. The possibility that either man could be Kathy's killer leaves an agonizing cloud of uncertainty as she's finally laid to rest. Then, a few weeks later, with Kathy and Barrick's three boys staying with his mother, Jackie gets a surprising request. Barrick had called us down to his and Kathy's house and told us to go through there and get out what we wanted. And I thought, that's kind of odd that you're wanting to get rid of their stuff. I mean, you know, we all wonder, is he going to move away where we can't talk to him anymore, something like that. But again, unless we can file charges on him, we really can't prevent him from doing that. As they pack up Kathy's belongings, Brenda discovers a chilling clue buried deep in a folder. Hey, Mom, Charlene, come look at this. There was a note in Beric's handwriting. The page comes from a file with a date marked well before Kathy went missing. And it said car, and it said insurance, and it said all these debts that were going to be paid off in the amount of them. And at the very bottom was funeral. A list of expenses and what? There's a funeral listed. When Brenda told me what was going on with this note and read it to me, what was on it, I mean, I was horrified. Well, where do you see that at? You know, with a list for debts that you owe to everybody, and then all of a sudden there's $5,000 there for a funeral expense. Oh my God, he's been planning this. Come look at 
Texas. Jackie Bolden has just discovered a disturbing note in the belongings of her murdered daughter, Kathy. Oh my God, he's been planning this. In her son-in-law, Barrick's handwriting, several months before her death, the note anticipates future funeral expenses. I can't believe that you found that. It was a whole bunch of figures on a piece of paper. Like, okay, this is how much money I have. And then he had little sections all over the piece of paper adding things up. One of the things on the list was funeral. $5,000. What funeral? What funeral is he trying to budget for? The file also refers to a life insurance policy. Now they set out to find it. I got the city directory for 1994. We went through that and every insurance company was mailed a letter saying that she was missing and that her body had been found, but we were trying to locate an insurance policy on her. Yes, this is Jackie Bolden. Oh, you do have a policy on my daughter? Ultimately, we did get a message from the company that had the insurance policy on Kathy. She let it lapse? She decided to look at what she could do to get him off of her insurance as beneficiary. She wasn't able to do so, so therefore, she let the policy lapse. There's no evidence that Kathy told Barrick about letting the policy run out. Oh, you do have a policy on my daughter? Kathy may have feared for her life, but it still doesn't add up to concrete evidence in the eyes of the law. All these individual things that, that we've talked about, the suicide, finding the car, a note uh, about paying for a funeral, things like that. That may be a good circumstantial case, but we don't have enough yet to be anywhere close to filing charges on him. Looking to build their case against Barrick, detectives re-interview his three sons the only potential witnesses they may have. And this time, Kathy's son tells a different story than the one police got almost five months earlier when he was first interviewed. The, the morning you saw your mom? I never saw her in the morning. You, you didn't see her in the morning. When was the last time you saw her? The night before. So this was the night before your mom went missing? My dad pulled us into the bedroom and said she was sleeping and not to bother her. How did you know your mom was sleeping? The covers were pulled up to her chin. So you all left the room, and your dad said, don't disturb your mom, she's sleeping. Yes. It's a small but telling detail. The sheets pulled up to his mother's chin, hiding the strangulation bruises on her neck. For Kathy's family, it's more proof that Barrick killed Kathy. I wanted him to be arrested. I wrote a letter to the district attorney. It was not a very nice letter. And I was pretty much demanding for them to do something and to do something now. Under intense pressure from the family, prosecutors finally agree to press charges against Barrick Barnum for the murder of his wife, Kathy. At trial, the prosecution lays out what they believe happened that warm December night over three years earlier. Kathy, please, we need to talk about this. We don't need to talk about it anymore. We have talked over and over and over. Listen to me, I'm begging you. My thoughts about what happened to Kathy are that she told Barrick she was leaving him. He already knew there was uh, possibly another man involved. What he's thought to himself is, I'm going to talk some sense into her. She's going to come back. I'm going to tell her I'm going to change. This is what I'm telling you. I'm not going to let you leave. But you can't make me stay. That's it. I'm done. I'm filing for divorce. That's when Barrick snapped. He's then put in a position to start making an alibi right there. And that's what he did with the whole showboat thing about putting her in bed, telling the kids she's asleep. 
Everything he did at that point was to make it look like Kathy was alive when she left the next morning and didn't return. Some think Barrick went to great lengths to deceive neighbors who saw Kathy's car pulling away early that morning into thinking she was still alive. He then drove out to the airport, dumped his wife's body, and returned home. It's a circumstantial case, but the jury takes just three hours to render a verdict. It was guilty. There's not any joy in that, you understand. But there is relief. There's like there's a resolution to this huge, monstrous problem that's been going on now for three years. You know, now maybe we can move on with our lives. Barrick is sentenced to 40 years in prison under Texas law. But he might have gone free if not for the relentless drive of Kathy's family. Jackie's just unstoppable. She's a basket of energy, not a bundle. She's a basket of it, and she never stops. It would have never come to the conclusion that it did without Jackie. There wasn't anything that Jackie Bolden wouldn't do. She didn't call me once in a while and say, hey, what's going on with the case, Tim Brink? No, she was active. She called you, and she wanted updates. She was a ramrod. She promised Kathy she would never give up, and she didn't. But the satisfaction of justice done rests side by side with the overwhelming loss. Kathy Barnum is still loved and dearly missed by those closest to her. I just feel bad when Mother's Day comes around and those kids have to bring flowers to my mother. But we do what we can to make up for it. I feel close to Kathy when I look at her sons when I talk to her sons and I see what wonderful, wonderful men they've turned out to be. Kathy was just a great mother.